In 2016, Square Enix released the latest entry in the long-running Hitman franchise to relatively muted fanfare. An episodic pseudo-reboot titled simply Hitman, the game went on to see critical success and gain a cult following, but was a sales disappointment, which led to the series nearly being killed entirely. Over the next half-decade, the so-called World of Assassination trilogy would prove to be the little game that could, surviving the most unlikely circumstances to release Hitman, Hitman 2, and Hitman 3. Surviving bizarre business strategies, poor rollout, a lack of marketing, a change in publishers twice, and a global pandemic, it's a miracle that the World of Assassination trilogy exists at all, which makes it even more surprising that not only do they exist, they're some of the best games of the generation. These games made every good decision they could, and provided around 20 of the finest video game levels ever created. Levels which are satisfying on a first glance, but which come to life more and more with each and every successive playthrough. This is intended as a level-by-level -level examination of the Hitman games, exploring the design, the writing, and the intricate detail oozing from every corner of the in-game world. I love these games, and I want to explain what I think makes them so special. Hitman begins in the year 1999. A bald man with no memory, no personality, and a tattoo of a barcode on his head has begun training in the International Contract Agency, or the ICA, a secret organization of professional assassins. The first face you see is a young Diana Burnwood, who is going through the Handler program, learning to be the support to a field agent. Our as yet unnamed protagonist is Agent 47, whose past is a mystery to everyone, including himself. Eric Soders, the ICA higher-up in charge of the training facility, is skeptical of putting 47 through. His physical ability is indisputable, but his lack of personal history is disconcerting. Still, Diana sees him as a potential future partner, and pushes for him to be put through training. These training missions are contextualized as recreations of actual missions of the past, which they are using to train, test, and observe candidates. The first mission is called Guided Training, a recreation of an old ICA contract from Sydney to assassinate a world-class cat burglar named Calvin Ritter. Guided Training is a linear tutorial to teach the player the most basic actions available in the game, such as subduing civilians, taking their clothes for disguises, and, when necessary, sneaking into restricted areas. The first time 47 steals a mechanic's clothes and puts them on as a disguise, Diana laughs. You put on his clothes? <laughs> That's a first. Still, she concedes it might work, as people tend to see the uniform and not the face. This is the core conceit of the game, and it immediately conveys exactly how disguises work, as the player can now walk right aboard the ship that was off-limits just moments earlier. It also explains the limitations of a disguise, as it introduces the game's first enforcer, NPCs capable of seeing through specific disguises related to who they might know. Making the first tutorial level a yacht was a strong decision. It's an easy way to explain how disguises can be used. Intuitively, staff-like mechanics are allowed on the lower decks, where yacht crew and guests are able to walk up to Ritter's private deck, and security can move around wherever they please. The game's unexpected sense of humor also starts to shine through here. It's surprisingly easy to forget once you've made it onto the ship and have your target in sight that the whole level is filled with actors, but the first time you hit a man over the head with a wrench, Diana giggles. <laughs> well, that's gonna leave a mark. Good thing we have insurance. The rest of guided training plays out quickly and efficiently, as you steal a new outfit to access the upper level of the yacht, and you observe Ritter's meeting with his client, Terry Norfolk. This gives you the private time you need to take him out. It's a solid tutorial, but once it's behind you, the game tells you to go wild for the first time. You took the yacht crew's clothes last time and observed Ritter's meeting with Terry Norfolk. What if, this time, you found a way to steal Terry Norfolk's clothes and attend the meeting yourself? What if you arranged an accident? and dropped a lifeboat onto Ritter's head. What if you poisoned his drink and drowned him in a toilet? Freeform Training, the sandbox version of the level, starts the player in front of a table full of tools. The lockpick, the coin, a remote explosive, these are toys the game is asking the player to go have fun with. There are three main routes onto the ship. The first, and most obvious, is through the staff entrance, which is what the guided training already taught players to do. The second, which is more difficult, is to walk right on board through the guest entrance. This can involve finding a way to lure Terry Norfolk away from the front of the ship, take his disguise, and walk right past the guards. The third route is hidden beyond a locked gate behind some boxes initially to the player's right. This gate is more hidden than the other options, but for players who explore, it is rewarding, as you can almost immediately get a yacht security disguise, which will take you all the way to the top of the ship. The highlight of this level is the Terry Norfolk route. Steal Terry's clothes and attend the same meeting you saw in the guided training in Terry's place yourself. From there, it's quick to take him out with the firewire or a silenced pistol while he stands there trying to remember his password. Or, 
If you'd rather, place a remote explosive beneath him and push the button as you walk away. There's no lethal poison available in the level, and no way to bring your own in. However, there is a medic poison to be found on the bottom floor of the ship, and this is useful to teach the player how the poisoning mechanic works. If you're a security guard, a mechanic, or Norfolk, then poisoning a drink will be suspicious and end with you in a shootout. But if you're a yacht crew, mixing drinks is part of your job, and no one is paying close enough attention to notice what you're slipping into Ritter's champagne. One of my favorite methods of taking Ritter out, although it's loud and will likely end with some civilians dying as well, is by sneaking onto the very top floor of the yacht and dropping a life raft onto Ritter's head. This is the first accident kill available to the player, and it's easy to set up. The helipad on top of the yacht is very lightly guarded, so just taking out that one guard and waiting, along with some quick crowbar usage, lets you drop the boat with ease. As long as no one actually sees you breaking the supports, no one is going to be suspicious of Ritter's tragic demise. If you want to try playing the game as a more standard shooter, there's an assault rifle and a shotgun in a small room to the left of where the player begins. I love the placement of these, because most players won't even notice the room their first or second time through the level. It's a subtle note, but it effectively communicates that going in guns blazing is a valid way to experience the game, but that it's not really what you're here to see. Part of the reason these levels are so great are the numerous easter eggs and nods forward that are hidden in them, along with details that make the game world so compelling. Freeform training is, of course, the smallest and simplest level of any of the games, but even it's not devoid of such notes. My favorite joke in the level, which highlights the game's offbeat sense of humor, is that the IKEA instruction booklet for the wooden yacht set can be found in the garage you first enter through, implying that the entire yacht and surrounding area was one single IKEA set the ICA bought. IOI also had some fun with the prequel setting of the map, as a number of conversations about this new thing called texting can be overheard in the mission. A cute nod to the prologue being set in 1999. Have you tried this texting thing? It's really quite addictive. I'm gonna look around, do the tour. What do you say, are you coming? Yeah, thanks, uh, I'll take a double. Oh, never mind. If you follow Ritter long enough, rather than taking him out during his meeting with Norfolk, you can also hear him trying to remember his password. Well, I'm rooting for you. Now once that password always slips my mind. Give me a second, it's just on the tip of my tongue. Maybe your childhood pet? You could try that. Wait, was it glass cutter? No. No, but something work-related. Callista, I forgot my password again. Give me a break, Calvin. Okay, is it Rover? One, two, three, four? No, it was clever. Well, you said so yourself, don't you remember? Why don't you? Oh, never mind. Wait, didn't you text yourself the password so you wouldn't forget? Uh, yes, yes, on the phone that's broken. As I said, technology hates me. <sighs> you in the 21st century is going to be an uphill battle, isn't it? Look, just take a walk, clear your mind. It'll come to you. <sighs> yes. More interesting for fans of the games who might not have gone back and paid attention to the freeform training level in a while are some surprising calls forward to future missions. The most obvious one is that Isabella Caruso, the mother of one of the primary targets of the Sapienza map, Silvio Caruso, can be found on the second deck of the ship, talking about how frightened she's become of her youngest son. Well, I was hoping around. Giles would join the rowing team, but cricket will just have to do, I suppose. And how are your kids, Mrs. Caruso? Three boys, wasn't it? Well, three survived puberty. Only minor property damage. Monkeys basically like their father. But good kids at heart. My youngest, Sylvia? That's a different story. Right, right. He's supposed to be some kind of child prodigy, isn't he? Oh, he's something like that. His teachers say he will do great things, but I... I think he could tell the wrong person he is. He makes my skin. Ah. Uh. Pull the wings off one too many butterflies, huh? Don't worry. My brother was like that. Owns a catering club. Dull as shit. Your Silvio will grow out of it soon enough. Oh, What's that, Mrs. Caruso? Oh, nothing. <laughs> Just thinking out loud. A much more subtle call forward is that one of the partygoers lounging on the first floor of the party is Thomas Cross, father of Jordan Cross, one of the targets from the Bangkok level later on, and a significant lore figure for the games. 
I've seen people saying there's dialogue where Thomas is specifically named as such, but I've never been able to get it to trigger, although targeting him in the contracts mode does confirm the name. Even in the context of the game, these aren't the actual characters, but rather actors portraying them. But it does indicate a connection between some of the higher-ups of the Hitman world, which is an idea the games play with more and more as time goes on, and the conspiracy built into the heart of the games unfolds. A call forward that surprised me on recent playthroughs was that two NPCs on the upper deck of the ship can be overheard commenting on how one of the paintings in Ritter's collection looks just like one which was famously stolen from the Stuyvesant's private collection a few years prior. Of course, they settle on the exact wrong conclusion, that the Stuyvesants must have been financially struggling and needed to sell off one of their paintings and double dip on insurance, rather than Ritter being a world-class art thief. Saw this painting, an original Gorka. Thing is, I could have sworn it was stolen from the Stuyvesant's private collection in Boston a couple of years back. Huh. Well, Stuyvesant went broke, didn't he? Sunk like a stone. There you go, then. Probably just told his friends the painting was stolen, so he wouldn't have to admit that he was selling off his assets. Hmm. Sounds reasonable. Huh. One man's loss, another man's gain. Marcus Stuyvesant is eventually revealed to be one of the Providence partners, and is one of the targets in the first level of Hitman 3, and his daughter Cornelia Stuyvesant appears as a supporting character in both the Isle of Segal map of Hitman 2 and the Dubai map of Hitman 3. I actually went back and checked if this dialogue existed back in Hitman, or if it had been added to the Hitman 3 version of the tutorial, since I'd never noticed it before. While it's a little difficult to get it to trigger, it does exist all the way back in the original game. One more incredibly cute detail from this mission. The yacht crew working in the kitchen, who is the first character you're guided to take down by hitting him over the head with a wrench in guided training, had a large bandage added to his head between Hitman and Hitman 2, doubtlessly from being hit in the head over and over again. Freeform training is a powerful statement as a tutorial level. By the standards of Hitman, it's an absolutely microscopic sandbox, but they still manage to fill it with a huge amount of variety and charm. This level alone can keep new players entertained for hours, and even compared to other games with famously strong tutorials like Portal, this feels like a level that's fun to play in its own right, not just as a prelude to bigger things. With that said, let's move on to the final test. 47 shatters records in the first training, and Soders has to admit that Diana is right about his potential. A perfectly trained blank slate, with virtually no emotion and no desire. A weapon that can be pointed at a target and execute a mission with no moral hesitation. Unlike Diana, Soders fears this potential, and that it might be used against the ICA. Cannot deny 47 a chance at a future with the agency, especially at Diana's urging, but he sets up a final exam that's designed to be impossible. A recreation of one of his own missions from the height of his career, where he infiltrated a Soviet base in Cuba and killed an American chess master turned spy. To make things worse, he designed the trial to be even more heavily guarded than the actual mission was. Soders is setting 47 up to fail, but he's underestimated his ability. The target of this mission is Jasper Knight, who is in hiding at an airfield in Cuba after assassinating a Russian ambassador a few days earlier. The ambassador was himself an American spy, who Knight killed by tricking him into playing a chess match with poison-coated chess pieces. Knight should have been evacuated by now, because he's a sitting duck for American agents like Soders and, by extension, 47. However, when he was set to leave, he insisted on bringing his girlfriend with him. When the Soviets refused, he decided to blackmail the KGB with threats of leaking information on a number of their US operatives, which blackmailing the KGB is just a really, really good idea. What could possibly go wrong? This is why the other principal named character is there, a frustrated Soviet colonel and KGB asset named Netsky, and the two are at a standstill waiting on orders from on high. Knight has a lot more personality than Ritter did in the first mission, and that personality is mostly being insufferable. If you try to talk to Knight while disguised as anyone other than Netsky, he brushes you off saying he has more important things to do than talk with you. The final test begins the introduction of mission stories, or opportunities in the first game. Guided and flashy, heavily scripted kills which are some of the best and most memorable content in the game. The first one players will likely come across is also my favorite. Two of the engineers outside of the base are discussing the safety checklist for Jasper Knight's flight, and that they specifically need to go over the safety checklist with Knight. They've disengaged the ejector seat so that Knight doesn't accidentally kill himself during the check in the hangar. Of course, that's exactly what we'd like to have happen. And so, after finding a mechanic uniform in the locker room, or stealing one off a hapless worker, you can use a wrench to re-engage the ejector seat, and then walk him through the checklist.
Target down. You did it. Now head towards an exit. It's fine. He's an actor. It's fine. This actually unlocks a lot of the game's comedy to me. The World of Assassination Trilogy are very funny games, and part of that is the realistic art style mixed with the heightened and exaggerated reality of what they're portraying. It might sound insane if you've only seen the game's marketing material, but Hitman is the greatest Looney Tunes game I can imagine. Map Bugs Bunny onto Agent 47, and Daffy Duck, Elmer Fudd, or Yosemite Sam onto the game's targets, and you wouldn't actually need to change that much to make the game work just as well. While you're exploring, in the same locker room where you can find the mechanics uniform, you can also overhear that Netsky is looking for some vodka, as a Russian colonel would do. You can find a bottle of vodka in the kitchen, bring it and place it on a platter in the office where Knight and Netsky patrol. In this same room, you can find Knight stumped on a chess puzzle. Specifically, he's stumped on solving the chess move that the Russian ambassador he played against, and assassinated, a few days earlier played, as he realizes that the ambassador, who was merely an amateur, had actually surprised him and would likely have won the match. You can hear two guards downstairs commenting on how Knight murdered a man just a few days earlier and is in severe danger from multiple world powers wanting him dead, and yet only seems fixated on trying to figure out how he would have beaten the ambassador at chess had he not, you know, murdered him. Walk up and interact with the board while no one is looking, and you can solve the puzzle yourself. The first in a long line of jokes about Agent 47's hypercompetence. If the vodka is placed and the puzzle is solved, Knight will propose a toast with Netsky. If you've poisoned his glass with some rat poison, you can then drown Knight as he runs off to the bathroom. If dressed as a Soviet soldier, Netsky will order you to run and get some projector slides for him from the reception area downstairs. Do so, and place the slides on the projector, and Netsky will bring Knight to the presentation of their route out of Cuba. If you turn the projector off from the breaker outside the room during the presentation, Knight, brain genius that he is, will say, Pfft, I know how machines should work, and start poking the wiring inside the projector, while Netsky wisely goes and checks the power switch. When Netsky turns the machine back on, you'll have yourself a deep-fried chess genius. The final mission story for the final test is to disguise yourself as Netsky and speak to Knight. 47 will tell him that his superior is on the other end of a radio call, waiting to talk to Knight directly about the decision regarding Knight's girlfriend's extradition. You can lead him to a secluded room on the other side of the hangar, and take him out while he's confused why he's only getting static on the other end of the radio. I love any time 47 disguises himself as a specific person, and people who really ought to know better just accept that the person they knew has been replaced with the world's most conspicuous man. After trying to talk to Knight as every other disguise and being rebuffed, it feels good to lure the self-centered egotist to his death as the only person he deems worth his time. I actually find this mission story much more difficult than the others, though, as the private room where you can lead Knight has a guard patrolling right outside of it, who can easily see you if you do anything to Knight, and open fire. Executing this kill requires either finding a way to get rid of the guard, which isn't the easiest task since he's relatively exposed, or timing things just so that you can take Knight out and hide his body before the guard patrols from one end of the room to the other and turns around. It's a good way to tutorialize that sight lines actually matter, and that no one in this game has eyes in the back of their head. That's the mission stories handled, but of course there are plenty of ways to take Knight out, some marked by challenges and some not, other than those opportunities. One of the unmarked opportunities is by firing through the skylight above the office where Knight patrols. You can hear two guards mentioning not liking how exposed the skylight is, but there's no challenge to take him out this way. It's just something you can discover. One method hinted with a challenge is to drop a spotlight on Knight by going to the roof of the hangar and out onto the catwalks above, and then shooting at the spotlight as he's standing beneath it. Super fun, and if you time it right, likely to be seen as an accident and avoid suspicion. One fun easter egg is a challenge called Hammer Time, directly referencing a streamer. This challenge is to complete the mission using only the hammer without being seen. No coins, no guns, no poison. Sneak into the hangar, find a way to get Knight isolated without picking up any other item, and hit him over the head with a hammer and snap his neck, then get out. It's challenging and really emphasizes how useful the coin has been. Luckily, once you work past some functional fixedness, you can also realize that the hammer, and for that matter, any thrown object, can be used as a coin in a pinch, which is the only way this challenge is even remotely achievable. This is also the first appearance of suit-only Silent Assassin as a classic challenge. Every level of the game past this tutorial includes a set of challenges called the Classics, containing Silent Assassin, which means only targets killed, no alarms raised, no bodies found, never noticed, suit-only, which is self-explanatory, 
Sniper Assassin, which requires you to take out all targets with a sniper rifle without ever being seen, and Suit Only Silent Assassin, which requires you to do everything Silent Assassin does without ever changing your disguise from one of 47's basic suits. Suit Only Silent Assassin always seems impossible when you're first starting a level, and is the ultimate test of skill in a mission. By the time you've reached Mastery 20 and gone through the level enough times to really instinctively learn the map and the AI routines, it seems just within reach enough to try. The final test is actually a really easy Suit Only Silent mission, as you might expect from a tutorial, but it seems daunting the first time you see it listed. Once you notice a pipe right outside the window where Knight patrols, however, it becomes relatively easy to take out the guards on the left side of the hangar, shimmy up the pole, lure Knight's guard into the bathroom, take him out and hide the body, and finally take Knight out unopposed. That's surely not the only way to do Suit Only Silent Assassin on this map, nor is it necessarily the easiest. The thing that makes this game so special is the functionally infinite avenues of approach, and I can never talk about literally all of them here. In any case, it's the perfect way to tutorialize how these challenge runs require you to change your thinking into playing the game more like a standard stealth game, like a Metal Gear or a Dishonored. One useful trick this map tries to teach you is using the guard's care with weapons to your own advantage. If you see a patrolling guard and drop a gun in his path, he'll find it and go take it inside the hangar for you. Not only is this a great way to get a pesky patrolling guard out of your way for long enough to take out and hide his buddies, it's also a great way later on to sneak weapons inside of secured areas, which 47 might need to pass a frisk to move past. The call forward on this level I find most interesting is who Knight and Netsky are waiting for orders from. As you eavesdrop on people in the base, you start to hear them talking about Janus in rumor and hushed tones. For some reason he flips, plans to defect. So on the very night he's supposed to meet with the foreign minister, Jasper Knight, one of Janice's turned American agents, has no choice but to break cover and assassinate him. Does it in the middle of a crowded party, with poison-coated chess pieces. Hmm. Doesn't strike me as the type. Best kind of spy. So this guy might know Janice. I mean, think about it. He might know who Janice really is. Whoever he is, he can probably pre-order that from Janice. KGB's top spy master. As you said, best kind of spy. It seems both Netsky and Knight are directly under this Janice. And when you disguise yourself as the KGB agent and trick Knight into calling on the radio, he asks, is it him? On the other end. Janice, of course, is one of the targets much later in the Whittleton Creek map of Hitman 2 along with being a major lore figure as the first constant of Providence. The final test is another killer tutorial level. I think between the two, I actually prefer freeform training to the final test, and both are easily eclipsed by the tutorial level from the second game, Night Call. Still, the final test has some great moments, and you can spend hours and hours on this one short tutorial level alone. What more, it supports it. Not only can you spend hours and hours before moving on to the game's first full level, but it's really fun to do so. Both the final test and freeform training feel only slightly less fleshed out than the full levels from Hitman Blood Money, and so contextualizing these as merely tutorial levels, but still filling them with variety and high-quality content, makes a huge promise. It is a promise which the game somehow manages to fulfill. After passing the final test, Soders looks to Diana and says, I hope you know what you've just done. Diana and 47 walk back to the helipad they entered on when the game opened, and Diana comments on 47's impressive performance. She notes that he never gave her a name and that the only lead they had, an abandoned hospital in Romania, came up empty. I think they called me 47. That's not a name. So make it one. All right. Agent 47. What follows is a montage of, pardon the pun, 47's greatest hits essentially showing that while the game jumps 20 years from 1999 to 2019, the events of the franchise more or less unfold. While Hitman is a reboot in that it requires no knowledge of previous games and gives the series new direction mechanically and narratively, it is still a sequel to the previous games. The montage is narrated by a gravelly-voiced man who talks about how 47's actions, along with the ICA, have shaped the world. You were always the best. Nobody ever came close. You define the art, and it defines you. Your actions have changed the world. Powerful men have fallen by your hand. But by the same token, 
others have risen. Do you realize what kind of world you've been shaping? Does the ICA? Does your handler? I live in that world. I have seen the consequences. I have felt the cost. That's what defines me. The man implies that, unbeknownst to them, Agent 47 and Diana have been working to make the world a worse place. He knows who they are, he knows what they do, and what they have done. He walks inside his hotel room, turning away from the Eiffel Tower, as we, the players, also move on to Paris.